Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ken Kirschenbaum, which you probably already know. Uh, uh, we have a special webinar today, uh, well attended. And uh, we know that uh, Jeff Swern, a, a well known expert in the alarm industry, uh, well regarded, uh, also happens to give a, a very uh, informative and entertaining uh, presentation. Uh, he's been here before. Uh, he's he's on a uh, I won't call it a mission, but he's 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 identified an issue that that he's championing right now, and and uh, 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 today he's going to explain what it is and and why it's so important and and why all of you need to uh, pay a tremendous amount of attention to it. And I I suspect that he didn't bring uh, Merton Bunker on. To contradict them, I, I guess uh, uh, Merton's going to be uh, providing uh, additional information. And Merton is a former NFPA employee, and, and uh, um, uh, I know you I know you didn't uh, uh, come here to listen to me. So I'm going to start uh, turn this over, and I'm going to give the screening to uh, Jeff and. You guys are now. You guys are now going to control the screen, and uh, Jeff, you can begin your presentation. Oh, I should say before Jeff starts his presentation, we will uh, take questions at the end. Uh, if there's only a few, may maybe I'll be able to unmute you. If not, uh, we'll read the questions to Jeff. If you if you have something serious to raise while during the presentation, uh, uh, hit us with a with a with a question. And and uh, I'll I'll try and interrupt uh, uh, Jeff to answer it, answer the question. Thanks, okay. Ken. Yeah, you're on your good, own. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this webinar is about a dangerous non-conforming control unit, and it's we're focusing on the UL issue. This problem was identified by me quite some time ago. Out in the fortifying alarm failures. Alarm systems failed, people have died, people have been seriously injured, and the fault was the actual data bus that took the system down. I have spent a tremendous amount of time investigating this. I brought in Merton Bunker to do a peer review of my investigation. Merton Bunker is a nationally recognized, internationally recognized professional engineer. He worked for NFPA for seven years. He was NFPA 72. He served as both NFPA signaling engineer and NFPA's chief electrical engineer. Uh, plus, he's an NFPA instructor. So we'll take a look at this and look at the criticality. The goal is to get this problem fixed and to make sure that life safety remains consistent and reliable. In our industry, really all aspects of our industry are dependent upon UL to make sure that their listing and testing services verify code conformity and reliability of the products. We also have the fact that all listed alarm systems, products, they shall comply with applicable UL and NFPA 72 standards. The word shall, as you know, is a mandatory requirement. It's not an option. And it's something that the professional and technical community of the alarm industry has been doing for decades or has made a good faith effort to do. Group manufacturers pay significant dollars to UL for their compliance testing and listing services. That equals trust in reliable life safety products. Alarm companies, authorities having jurisdiction, part of the statutory fire codes, they adopt fire codes, they adopt NFPA 72, UL standards, and they trust UL. Alarm companies and installers trust UL's compliance and testing services, and insurance companies, which is also an AHJ, as you know, trust UL's compliance test and, and listing services. So we start off there. What happens when UL represents to consumers or the alarm industry that they, test, they tested products to UL and FPA 72 standards and list them despite the equipment being non-conforming? We'll get into that. UL lists a non-conforming product. What, if any, consequences are there? And who holds UL accountable 
for listening equipment despite the non-conformity or the non-conforming function or loss of function. I received a letter in response to a 43-page expert report and peer-reviewed expert report from Merton Bunker that I wrote to Jennifer Scanlon, who is the president of UL. The letter was from principal engineer Larry Shudak. I believe Mr. Shudak has been with UL for about 43 years. In this letter, and if you don't have a copy, uh, you can look on LinkedIn or you can ask me for a copy. There are certain admissions that are made by Mr. Shudak in response to my, my expert report and Mr. Bunker's expert report. Let me just stop for a minute. Merton, you looked at this letter, you analyzed this letter. Was there anything here that changed your opinion that this control panel was non-conforming to UL and NFPA 72 and why? Uh, no, it, there was nothing there that, that would change my opinion. And the fact of the matter is that we're talking about common wiring between a burglary and fire alarm panel. And the problem exists on common wiring. And the standard requires that that common wiring be tested uh, such that devices that are part of that common wiring don't take down the entire system. So that was not... That was not to me, that was not uh, refuted here at all. Fair enough. Let's go on to the next slide. So Johnson Controls first sent me a letter in response to my comments and my test of the Johnson Controls Power Series Pro Control Unit. Johnson Controls made statements that my statements were inaccurate and that I didn't test the product properly. And they also made statements that the keypad goes dead. Prior to this, I received written communications from their senior technical department personnel who advised me the system does shut down. Despite what Johnson Control says here, for example, that their radio remains powered, even though the system shuts down, is meaningless because of the fact that the best the radio can do is send a trouble signal during the fire emergency. There's not going to be a home. The keypads are not going to sound. The remote station is not going to receive an alarm signal. So we have a panel that, again, these are not my standards. These are minimum standards that have been around Merton. These standards that we've been talking about, UL 985, and UL 1023, the household bird standard, NFPA 72. I mean, how long have these, these requirements of the common wiring protection uh, that it doesn't take down the system been in effect? I believe, well, as long as I've been involved with it, which is since 1994. So it's been quite some period of time. And of course, the, you know, the standards are constantly revised, but I went back and I, I don't have all of the standards going back for UL, but I looked back through NFPA 72 and clearly the requirement that we're talking about uh, has been in the code since before 1994. It was, I believe, probably in the alphabet series of 72, uh, prior to my arrival at NFPA and prior to their recombination into NFPA 72 in 1993. So it's been quite some period of time that they've been in the code. Fair enough. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Now, this is going to be, it's about two and a half minutes. This is a demonstrative test. You can start the test. And basically what we have here is to the left, we've got a Power Series Pro Control Unit, which is represented UL 1023, UL 95, We've got a blowtorch on the right, uh, which is actually attacking the core bus in the wall. Merton, how much hotter is a fire than this blowtorch starts in the wall, just generally speaking? Well, this this torch is probably somewhere in the ballpark of eight or nine hundred degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the wiring that you see here, this is looks like a standard FPL or FPLP cable. Uh, it is. It's a thermoset plastic. And it, it's not going to stand up well to, you know, temperatures of, of this magnitude. It probably, the plastic insulation probably breaks down somewhere around six or 700 degrees. And this torch is probably, I would say in excess of a thousand degrees. Uh, in, a, in a real fire, you know, it, it, the fire could be anywhere from, you know, eight, 900 degrees all the way up to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on where in the sequence that it is. I mean, when, when you start a fire, 
or a fire begins, it starts in a home, it's incipient. It's very, you know, low temperature. It's going to grow probably a doubling about every two minutes. And eventually the room will flash over or the stud cavity where the wiring is will get very hot. Um, this is certainly not out of the realm of comparison. This is this torch would be very comparable to an actual fire in a home. Can I just stop for a minute? So everyone just noticed the keypads are dead, the transceiver's down, the, the motion detector's down. And I'm going to hit four, four wire hardwired smokes, UL268 listed into alarm. You'll notice the red LEDs go off, but no siren sounds at all. So you've got four hardwired smokes going off. The data bus has been impaired in the wall. From that point, in some, you know, most cases, the fire will eventually spread into the footprint of the home. So by the time the fire gets inside the home, you're going to get a red LED, and the central station is going to get a trouble signal. And if you go to LinkedIn, you'll see the full video. There are many videos on this particular control unit. A catastrophic failure, violating these three standards. And again, the core bus can be anywhere. It can be in the wall, in the attic, in garages, in basements. And everything on this panel is connected in parallel. So let's talk about the parallel connection with, for example, a motion detector. Aux power from the motion detector, a glass break on a Berg circuit, a dead short on that wire takes the fire system down. Merton, what is the standard of care regarding a fire system taking a Berg, pardon me, a Berg system taking a fire system down? Well, NFPA 72 does not permit that. Uh, if you have combination wiring, a fault on the combination wiring is not permitted to result in any loss of fire alarm transmission, period. So you have to have an alarm signal sounding and the alarm signal has to be transmitted to the supervising station if there is one. And one of the things that's interesting, if you take a look at, the, uh, at some of the communications I've received back, is that if the panel does not sense an alarm, for example, a wireless radio receiver or the hardwired transceiver on this panel shuts down with a short in the bus. So that's not getting any wireless transmissions. If it's an RF keypad, well, the bus is shorted, that's not gonna get any get any wireless transmissions, so we have no alarm. So again, whether the radio is powered or not, it's not sending any alarm, and we're not getting audibility. Go to the next slide, please. So again, once the data bus wiring, no, go back, I'm sorry. Once the data bus wiring is shorted, the test, you've seen the test, Merton, correct? Yes. And there's no audible warning, and there's no signal going to the remote station, no alarm signal. Is there any question in your mind that this deviates from the minimum requirements in the plain language of UL and NFPA 72? No, the test that you ran in your video clearly shows that the products do not comply with that requirement. So let me ask you something, what happened? Nothing. Um, you, you, a trouble signal was transmitted, and that was the only signals transmitted. The fire department will not respond to that. That typically would be something that the supervising station would call the subscriber or the owner to resolve, or they would call the owner's home at some point within four hours, not within two to three minutes. Um, there's no alarm. Therefore, the occupants of the building would not know that there's an alarm in the building. And with today's lightweight construction, particularly in dwellings, they're not sprinklered in many cases, in most cases that is, uh, you've got two to three minutes to escape. If it's two in the morning, you're probably not going to escape. So this is a real problem. If you have no alarm sounding and no one knows about the, the trouble, the keypads are inoperative. Uh, you know, Usually you put a keypad in the bedroom, uh, the master bedroom or at the front door, you, you're not going to hear anything. So, because the keypads are inoperative and there's no alarm signal. So that's a big, big problem. Fair enough. Next slide, please. Uh, Merton, can you talk about this escape time from your experience as a fire protection engineer, cause and origin investigator, NFPA expert regarding this 
this window of opportunity and how critical that is to life safety. Yeah, it, today's today's structures are built with lightweight construction, and then we fill them up full of highly, you know, combustible material, you know, plastics and uh, furnishings. Uh, once you have a a fire in a room, typically it doubles in size about every two to three minutes, and you have roughly two to three minutes to escape. Uh, many of you have probably seen the NFPA's video series called Firepower where they take a trash can fire in a, in a small bedroom and the room flashes over in under two minutes. The room is untenable in less than a minute and a half. So you, you have very little time to escape. So a system that's not working is gonna result in some problems. Fair enough. Can you go to the next slide, please? So what I wanna focus on now and both of us on what I consider in my opinion to be dangerous standard violations. We have this response from UL, and I want to go over what UL said versus what the standard says. So, if the four corners of the language in the four corners of the standard do not include language such as directly interconnected versus common wiring, or if they say is to be applied only where non-fire alarm equipment is directly connected, that's not part of UL 985, is it? No, um, common, common wiring, th th we use very specific language in our standards and codes in this country. And th th we use the term common interconnected or common wiring. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure why those terms were used in the letter that responded to you. I'm not sure, I, I didn't write the letter, but certainly they didn't use the exact same language that was in their standard or in NFPA 72. Right, so if it's not in the standard, I don't know if you agree or not, but you can't just say it so and everyone should believe it. So it's gotta be in the standard. So we've got uniformity and we can interpret the language in accordance with the intent and what the plain language says, correct? Correct. So again, this is the language, this is their language. This is not my language, it's not your language. This has been together in no committees for decades. Why this problem got missed? I don't have an answer. Do you? No, I, I, I truly don't. Um, I, I, I don't work at UL, so I don't know. But uh, it, it certainly is puzzling. So you, you've got a fire alarm system, combination listed system, that's required to comply with statutory duties how many states approximately does NFPA 72, how many states is that adopted across all the country? It's adopted in all, all 50 states. So can anyone change the language in order to circumvent the requirements? For example, in this case, to change the word common wiring to directly connect in order to make it look like it's still conforming. Well, the, the, the only way you can change the code is through a local amendment um, or through the committee process. Um, and the committee has chosen not to change these, uh, this language for you know, several decades. And I'm, I don't know of all local amendments to the code. Certainly I don't live in all 50 states or I don't work in all 50 states, but uh, the only way to really change the code is to, is to go out and do a local amendment at the city, state or county level. And you can, you can change the code that way through the board of, of um, uh, through the local board of, of um, uh, appeals or variance, no, not appeals, like but the variance board. Yeah, you do it that way through the the board of of uh, PEs that can help write this language and get that uh, in, incorporated into the revised code for your jurisdiction. But I'm not aware of any place that's done that. Either either am I. But from a life safety perspective, my understanding is that you can meet the minimum standards, you can exceed the minimum. Standards, but you can never go below the minimum standards. Correct? That is correct. The you know as as an installer owner, you can always exceed the the minimum requirements of the code, and you can always do that. But you have to meet the minimum requirements as again at a minimum. Uh, the AHA can only enforce what's in the code and cannot make you go uh, put in additional requirements beyond the code. So, as an owner, I always choose to go above that minimum level of code based on the risk 
that I have to deal with, or as a designer, I will go above the code based on risk, but I cannot ever go less than what the code requires. Fair enough, but I think a lot of people on this call will say, listen, the customer doesn't want to pay for the right system. My answer is you just don't put the system in. In other words, the right system has to comply with UL 985, 1023, and NFPA 72 with regards to detection scheme and functionality, correct? That's correct. You, if, if, so, you so, a, if you put a system in, it must meet requirements that are adopted as law. And so what happens is the building codes and fire codes will adopt NFPA 72 by reference. And then NFPA 72 adopts, if you will, the UL and other standards, product standards by reference. So where it's required to put a system in, or you put it in, it has to meet all of those things. I've seen a couple of alarm company contracts where they tell the customer, we're not complying with NFPA 72, it's your responsibility, and you're getting what you paid for. What's your opinion of that? Uh, I wouldn't do that. I personally, there's too much liability. Yeah, associated with but, that. I. But, but let's assume for the moment that there was no liability to anyone on this call not to equipment manufacturers, not to UL, not to alarm companies. I've dedicated my life like yourself to the life safety industry. We still want to do it right. We have to do it right, not just for our families, but for everyone else that relies on this fire alarm system. If someone knew tonight that there was going to be a fire in their home, they do everything they could to protect their family and themselves. Not an expert, a consumer, just a regular consumer. And they rely on this system, and all it takes is for one part of either the data bus wire, or for example, let's say you've got an attached garage, fire starts in the garage, it burns into the footprint of the home, it takes out the key pan, it shorts the bus, the system catastrophically fails. I don't care if you have five smoke detectors, 100 smoke detectors, two, it's, it's irrelevant. So we have this illusory fire safety issue, and it's not something that is optional. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So I've looked at this. And I want to go back to something before we get into this particular slide regarding UL. If I'm an equipment manufacturer and I want to have UL test this product, you saw the test that I performed to verify if it's compliant. Obviously, if I performed the test and the system functioned, we wouldn't be here. The test that I performed, could, is that similar or substantially similar to verifying, I'm not, you know, a short if it, the alarm works or fails, or can you explain how UL looks at a paragraph, for example, and then test the panel against that? Well, I, I, I'm, I have not worked at UL, so I'm speaking only based on what I would assume that they do. If there's a requirement that the, a short on the data bus cannot take down the panel, I would presume that they would take as part of their testing of that product uh, and, and short that, that data bus and watch what happens and ensure that the devices connected to it actually operate. Um, if they don't, then they should not list the product. If uh, I mean, thank you, no I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, uh, so on December 18th, 2020, the last, the very bottom of the page, it states this is from Larry Shudak, where when non fire alarm devices are directly connected to the fire alarm listed devices products, comma, which are in turn connected to the communication bus, short circuit faults are applied directly to the non fire alarm devices and the interconnecting wiring to the fire alarm listed devices products. Compliance is confirmed when the short circuit faults do not affect the fire alarm and or carbon monoxide alarm signaling operation. So that's what UL responded to me through their president. The test, I, test that I performed, does it support that UL could have tested it based on the short concept? Right. And, and I mean, your video shows that you did that, and it shows that it failed. So I, I'm 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 not sure. I can't speak for UL, but I'm not sure, you know, how how that all works over there. I again, I'm not there, but I will tell you that your video is very clear. You short out the data bus, the system fails. Right, and and talking going further than the data bus, let's talk about the zone expansion modules. They're out in the field. 
They can have Berg only. They can have fire in Berg. If that zone expansion module, which has eight zones on it, is attacked by fire and those wires melt, and I want to talk about, let me stop for a moment. Can you talk about the foreseeability of a short circuit during a fire on a low voltage alarm wire? Well, it's it's possible. It's very it's very possible and very likely during a fire. It, th we're talking about 24 volt wiring here with thermoset plastic insulation that melts at a reasonably low temperature. Okay, so any attack by fire is going to quickly melt that insulation and cause a short. And most of these addressable devices ride on the data bus and the wirings run through the house. So a fire is going to quickly attack that uh, insulation and cause a short, which is going to cause system failure. Now, there was some contention by UL that there's no requirement for pathway survivability to attack by fires on household systems. I have an opine that there is. Is this about pathway survivability in your mind? No. Uh, pathway survivability is not a not required in a dwelling unit, but B, if it were uh, something that you would do, it would be cost prohibitive. Well, not cost prohibitive, but extremely expensive. CI cable is listed for direct attack by fire. It's made for that purpose. However, it has to be, in most cases, affixed to a two-hour wall, which you typically don't have in standard one and two family dwelling construction. And it costs about five to 10 to $12 a foot. So what homeowner is going to spend that kind of money uh, to protect that data bus? None, because they don't want to spend an extra yeah. $2,000 to run CI cable throughout their home. But I mean, the idea of this panel is not to put CI cable on, it's to conform with the standards and codes that have been right created as part of the statutory duties in all 50 states. Right, yeah. This the, is the not new information. Yeah, the purpose of a fire alarm system in a dwelling is to provide life safety, okay? So what we wanna do is get people awake or alert them quickly that there's a problem in the building so that they can safely evacuate. Property protection is not anticipated under chapter 29 of 72, and we wanna get them up and, and out. And that's all this is intended to do. So if, if the system doesn't do that, well, we have a problem. I want you to assume that there's a fire and forensic investigation ensues and it's determined that the reason the fire alarm system failed to activate is due to a dead short on one part of the data bus, similar to what I showed in my demonstration. You're investigating for the person who was seriously injured. You're investigating for the person who died. It really doesn't matter who you're investigating from. Based on those facts, determine that the data bus was attacked by fire. That's the only fault on the footprint of the system. The, the control unit is, is not been damaged by fire. The communication path's not been damaged by fire. And obviously, well, in this case, there was no explosion that took the whole house down. What would, where would you generally land on something like that if you found that the only fault was potentially multiple parts of this bus, one or multiple? I'm assuming it would be multiple because the fire is not going to stop at one point in a premise. Right. Yeah, I, I would I would clearly be focused in like laser beam on that particular problem. Um, if if the if the shorted data bus caused the system to fail, I mean, I would go look at the control unit, maybe the data if it's an addressable panel, look at the history, okay, and see you know the timeline of this thing, see what signals came in at what time, if any, and you know move from there. So you'd have to go back and, and look at that. If the panel wasn't damaged, that's great because now you have you know, some way of, of actually recreating what happened. Uh, but in many cases you don't. But in, in that case, yes, you have some equipment that can give you some forensic information that you might not, not normally have. And, and certainly if the data bus had shorted, you'd be able to see in that, in that, in that uh, alarm history, event history, if there was an alarm sounded or not. So that would be that would be the best of, of all cases where you have a panel that's not damaged by the fire. You know, following the scientific method, I agree with you. With regards to wireless systems, I've had some questions, uh, not in this seminar webinar yet, but well, what about a wireless system? Well, what I've seen is that the wireless systems are just as susceptible because of the fact that the wireless dual diversity radio receiver is on the bus. Some of the wireless receivers are built into the keypads. So if there's a short circuit on the data bus, 
how is it going to hear the wireless transmissions coming from these wireless smoke detectors? Well, it won't. That's the problem. It won't. Right. And, you know, I think it's great that someone put a wireless receiver in a keypad. The problem is now we've got it really, again, we've got it right out in the field and everything's connected in parallel. You cannot connect these devices in series. It wouldn't make a difference. You can't separate them because there's one bus. On more expansive panels, it works differently. We have a fire alarm enunciator. That's all that's on that bus. And everything else is separated and isolated. So I'm advocating for Johnson Controls to immediately recall this panel, notify the CPSC, warn subscribers of this problem. I mean, Merton, just in a general sense, not Johnson Controls, any manufacturer that has this problem, where would they start if they had called you and said, Merton, what do we do? Well, we'd have to go and look at how we could isolate, you know, the the other equipment from the fireside, right? That's what you would want to do. Isolate the equipment so that a fault on the non-fire portion doesn't cause loss of the fire alarm signaling. That's the key to this whole thing. Fair enough. Go to the next slide, please. So I, I also believe that alarm contractors need to be paid to fix this problem. They purchased the equipment, they relied on the documentation which, show it's, which shows it's listed, they've got to fix this problem. And I think they have to be paid. Do you have an opinion on that? Either way, just in a general sense, if well, they didn't I manufacture mean, it? I mean, if, if the product is not conforming, uh, Somebody, and it's supposed to be, somebody has to fix it, okay? So who's going to pay for that? Well, that's that's probably not for me to decide, but or probably not even for you to decide, but who would decide that? Well, maybe a court of law would decide that. I'm not sure. I'm not an attorney. However, uh, somebody, should be, somebody should be looking at uh, how to correct the problem and, and what we can do to quickly fix the problem to mitigate the risk that we have, right? So... You know, as far as who pays, that's that's not my decision. But I, I would certainly think that we'd want to do something to mitigate the risk. Fair enough. So alarm contractors are in a situation where they have a right to rely on that UL sticker, correct? That's correct. And they're relying on that. I mean, I don't know in your experience, but I don't know of any customer that if I went to sell them an alarm system and I said, I just want you to know this control panel is not UL listed for household burger fire. It doesn't comply with NFPA 72. Please sign here acknowledging the aforementioned. Could you think of anyone in your experience that would ever knowingly get a control panel or any part of an alarm system that doesn't comply with the general fire code, not that they know what the fire code is, but they have a general idea that UL means safety. I mean, when you hear about UL and NFPA 72, I believe it it's credibility, it's it's safety. How do you land on that? I, I don't know of anybody who would do that. Um, I certainly wouldn't. If somebody came to me and said, we'll, we'll sell you a vehicle, but uh, we're not gonna have any warranty on this. And by the way, uh, it, it doesn't meet any of the DOT standards that are in force today, or it doesn't meet this standard or that standard. Like, no, I'll buy something else. I'm not going to buy a product that doesn't meet the required standards. It's not a good idea ever. The problem is that many, many owners of these systems don't even know this. That's the problem. And I think many alarm companies don't know it. That's possible. They're looking at the equipment manufacturer specs. They're connecting it with what the manufacturer states. They're complying with what the manufacturer states. And when they do their yearly inspection in accordance with 72, they don't have a duty to test the panel to verify it's compliant, correct? Right. They're buying a product that is that is conforming in their minds to the code. They're trying to follow the code. And then the authority having jurisdiction would presumably inspect it and assume the same. And it would then be installed and tested in the field as required by code. And that would that would satisfy their their obligation in their minds. So, you, I mean, my experience with inspectors, electrical inspectors, and fire inspectors, do you think they'd have any chance to detect this problem? 
or they rely on the alarm contractor? Is that even part of their scope? Let's say they inspect the system. How are they going to know about this? They're not, because the inspector isn't looking to see if if a laboratory did X, Y, and Z as required by product standard one, two, three. They're looking to see that it was installed properly in the field. They're looking to make sure that they're using the products that are required by code. And then they're going to presumably, if it's a fire inspector or a fire marshal, test the system to make sure it conforms to the code requirements. Uh, the, the electrical inspector will probably only look at wiring and make sure it's installed properly. And after that, probably won't look at it again. So during the rough in inspection, the electrical inspector may look at the wiring and then the fire marshal or fire inspector may come at the end and make sure the system operates as intended. And they'll make sure that the products meet the, the listing uh, as required by NFPA 72. But they're not going to look to see, gee, did the, did the laboratory did do this test, that test, and that test. They're going to look only at, is it listed? And if it's not, then you cannot use it. If it is, great. They'll allow its use. So at the end of the day, we've got the alarm contractor is going to install it. He's going to test it or she's going to test it, but it's going to test. If it's properly programmed and designed, installed, et cetera. And then we've got the yearly inspection, the ITM, and that's going to pass. We have an automated monthly test signal. Well, that's going to go through on the DACT. Uh, and we've got the AHJ who really is somewhat far removed from what's going on behind the scenes with this particular panel on a non-conforming issue. Usually I would think they would find this out after a serious fire, after someone's injured. And then at that point, they would throw it back to the lawyers and the lawyers will, as of course Ken on this, they deal with it. I mean, whether or not the alarm company, in my experience is responsible, I've been involved defending alarm companies, they still sue the alarm company, regardless of if they're the, the primary tort fees or wrongdoing. And obviously Ken will chime in on that. Go to the next uh, slide, please. So we talked about this. Subscriber suffers a loss. Someone says, listen, I, you know, I didn't hear the alarm go off. No signal goes to the remote station. There's a nexus there. In my experience, plaintiff's lawyers are going to potentially target the alarm company, the manufacturer. UL is also likely. But again, this is a Ken issue, but I wanted to talk to you about that. Data bus, danger case studies. I've had a bunch of cases, unfortunately, I've worked on where something has gone wrong. If, it, if it's just a property damage issue, instead of the fire being somewhat contained in the early stages by a responding fire department, by the time the fire department gets a signal, it's based on someone driving by versus the alarm coming in. So we still have damage on a fire. There's not going to be no damage, correct? Yeah. Generally speaking, if you have a fire, even if it's detected very early, unless it's something where people are awake and have an extinguisher in their hand, there's going to be property damage. And my experience has been that in modern construction, the property damage is generally severe. Within you know 10 or 15 minutes, the house is usually not uh, something that you can you know just clean up a little bit and, and patch and paint. It's usually the house is within 15 minutes, the house is generally uh, gone. And, and unless it's caught at the incipient stage, then no. Uh, your, your chances of just cleaning up and, and uh, you know, patch and paint or just replace a little bit of carpet and drywall, no, that's not going to happen. Fair enough. Okay, so the last three really talk about enforceability of alarm contracts with non-conforming controls, licensing laws, building fire codes, and what do alarm companies do? And I'm going to throw that to Ken because that's really his expertise over many other things. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So these are just, again, Ken Kirschbaum and Kirschbaum and Kirschbaum are not responsible for the content of this webinar, nor do they necessarily hold our opinions or views. Uh, so if we can switch it to Ken uh, with any questions uh, that have come up, I think that would be a good start. Oh, we have one other slide. Uh, I think we went, no, you know, that's the same slide. Can you go back to the, the last slide or take the slide off and Ken can go back on? Thank you. Well, thanks for that disclaimer, which I, I never, I see you're a careful guy. That's good. We have a lot of questions. I'm glad that you uh, stopped where you did because um, some of these questions, of course, keep in mind, came in uh, at the beginning of your presentation and throughout the presentation, you may have addressed some of these issues. So I want to just, uh, uh, if some of the questions don't are not applicable or timely, then we'll move on. But the first one says, 
the speaker, meaning you, promotes UL, are other NRTs not comparable to UL? Well, all, all the NRTLs are required to comply with the same UL their national library if they just listen under their uh, testing laboratory standard. I wasn't focused on that, but entertain. Can, can, um, can, can, is, that, can, is that any better? Can, can't different testing uh, laboratories can? ha, can't different testing laboratories have different uh, recommendations or results? You're, we lost your audio, Jeff. Mer I mean, they can have different recommendations or results. But okay, hold because, on a second. Uh, Jeff, Jeff, you're um, having some bandwidth I may, issues. Mert, you uh, want to take over for a minute? Yeah, Jeff, take, uh, turn off your camera. I think you're having bandwidth issues on your end. I, I, you keep skipping on your audio and video. So if you turn off your camera for a few minutes while we're doing the wrap up on this, I think that'll help. But to answer the okay, question. Okay, is that any better, Ken? Yeah, so far. Yeah. So at the at the end of the day, uh, a, a different product testing laboratory or nationally recognized testing laboratory or NERDL as they're called, could get different results depending on how they read and understand a product standard. But they are, if a product is listed to a product standard, it doesn't matter which testing laboratory did it, they would test it how they understand the requirements of that product standard. And presumably, they would read it um, the way you would read it. Yeah, there, I just want to point out, there is a difference between um, uh, NFPA and UL. Uh, and the other testing laboratories because NFPA has been adopted by building codes. I don't know if UL has or, or any of these other uh, uh, regulatory or, or testing agencies, but uh, NFPA is adapted, uh, adopted as law. So, so its guidelines are now law. So that, that's one distinction that you have, right? Here's that's a point. serious distinction. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, NFPA, NFPA standards are adopted by the building codes or directly by local jurisdictions. They contain references to product standards, which makes those product standards part of that code, which would, as you say, can make them law. So they would right. have to comply with those standards in order to meet the law. Okay. Um, the next question is, is, is it not a fact and I don't know whether it is a fact or not, Mr. Zwerin makes and sells a product that protects the data bus. Is this part uh, of the reason that he's giving this presentation? Is it, is it UL? Well, that's, I don't know, is that true? Is, is you sell a Well, that, yeah, yeah, so let me step back. I, I, don't sell, I don't sell the product. I do have a patent on the technology, but that's not the reason we're having this presentation. And I've been talking about this for quite some time. This is okay. not to sell a product. This is not to even talk about the product. This is talking about a defect in other manufacturers' products. It's clear that I have the patent, but that's not the reason here. This is a life safety issue. The manufacturers have to comply. Uh, it, it's not about my product. It's not about what I identified. And quite frankly, when I originally identified it, I didn't even look at the codes and standards, Ken. I assume, like everyone else, the codes and standards are being followed. I did it to make alarm systems safer, but that's yeah. not what the seminar or this is information. This, is this product? Do you? Is there a product that uses your patent? There, I have a patented product, but it is not being sold. Oh, so so it's not being sold. So they can't get it to help alleviate this problem. They they cannot get. It's not being sold this time. That's correct. Okay. Right. Okay. So far, I'm not saying that wouldn't change, but this is about life safety. Okay, this, okay. The, the, and again, I don't, put, I don't need to. I don't want to put you on the defensive for that. Let's move. No, on. I'm not defensive. Fine. Okay, okay. So far, this uh, this is a comment. So far, this appears to be only a DSC problem. I believe that Honeywell, at least, is subject to the same concerns. That's a comment. Uh, uh, and that's by someone who sits on the UL board in Canada. Yeah, it, 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 the single data bus problem, it's, you know, this is not about Honeywell in this particular webinar. We only have an hour, but this is a problem with most equipment manufacturers. The Honeywell Vista line, uh, I've tested that. It's got the same problems. Okay, so the DSC is a manufacturer, I take it, along with Honeywell? Correct, Johnson Controls. And it also, on the, on the Vista panel, it also affects, I tested both their 
household Berg fire panels and also their commercial Berg fire panels, uh, the 128, the 32, and they also have the same problem. All right, now this one's coming from an AHJ, so you better pay attention. The ICC International Fire Code, IFC, provides 901.10 recall of fire protection components. Any fire protection system component regulated by this code that is the subject of a voluntary or mandatory recall under federal law shall be replaced with approved listed components in compliance with the reference standards of this code. <laughs> the fire code, fire code official shall be notified in writing by the building owner when the recalled component parts have been replaced. Now, uh, now the problem with that is I don't think that any of these products have been recalled, have they? No, they haven't been recalled. The purpose of me sending the letter with an expert report, which I can, which is on LinkedIn, I can provide it to anyone, and Merton Bunker's peer review report, is to get UL, to get these manufacturers take ownership of this problem. All right. So the AHJ's comment it would, will be will be important once there's there is if if there ever is a recall of the product. Uh, here's another comment. Uh, the manufacturer, NFPA, a UL, or CPSC, uh, uh, if they, oh, oh, if they issue a recall, then the sec, is the AHJ saying this, then the section will apply. Uh, Correct. Why was this product selected as opposed to others that are on the market? Uh, that That's a different- Fair enough. The, the, else. Yeah. Well, no, I, right. The, the the reason the Johnson Controls control panel was referenced, and I've referenced others before this, is that Johnson Controls represented that their panel complies with the sixth edition of UL 985, which is the first time in about 20 years that the standards have changed, even though the fifth edition, these panels are not conforming either. And because of that, I wanted to test the product that was represented as complying with the latest version of UL 985. Not all manufacturers of household Berg fire panels, even though they're non-conforming, are compliant with the sixth edition. But this is just for this particular webinar. Okay. Um, this came early on, one of the first question. Uh, you started to sing the praise of UL and then you attacked UL. Uh, so who are we supposed to trust? Well, I, I didn't attack you well. I'm I'm calling the facts. I trust you well. I, I was a listed provider in 1984 of UL certificated systems. The issue is there's a problem here. Okay. I want you to take responsibility and the manufacturers take responsibility for this problem. I believe they have the capability to do this, but you know, it's it, there's no perfect fact pattern. We've got UL that does a lot of good things, but here they missed it. It's got to get corrected. So you, I can't say UL is bad because I believe in UL. In this case, in my opinion, they've done something that's egregious and has to be corrected. It's not an option. As the HJ just said, it's got to be fixed. And I identified this problem quite a while ago, and I've spent my own money investigating it to see what the reality is. And this is our reality. We have enough problems in the alarm industry. We don't need non-conforming control units. We need to provide the best life safety that we can. When I came to your house, Ken, and looked at your fire alarm system and your annual Christmas thing, you know, that was a methodology issue that got fixed. But we all need to look at this together because we're stronger together than we are apart. I, I think that you look, you know, alarm professionals want to do the right thing. And uh, uh, the 2016 NFPA 72 Chapter 14 Inspection, Testing and Maintenance. 14.2.2.2.4 further provides in the event that any equipment is observed to be part of a recall program, the system owner or the, uh, uh, or the system owner's designated representative uh, shall be, uh, well, again, uh, uh, this doesn't apply because there's been no, re shall be notified in writing. Well, it doesn't apply again, no recall yet. So we don't have to deal with that. Uh, it would appear that all this is needed is a recall by the CPSC to resolve the issue. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I, that seems like to be the answer here. If the manufacturer wants to acknowledge this and, and issue a recall, is that right, Jeff? Or, or well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously, you know, I, I'm in my expert world, but in the cases I've been involved in, 
there's a, been a lot less on class actions against these kind of situations. No, uh, not, an, he's not asking that. He's asking, is it is it this would be this this issue would get resolved if the manufacturer manufacturers agreed or or did issue a recall. That would solve. Well, I would hope so. Then these, then these components would have to be replaced. Here's another question. Right. I mean, the, yeah. right. I mean, the issue is, you know, right now what I'm getting is denial. I'm getting false right. claims right from you. Now, right now, you've identified a problem. The manufacturers don't agree with it, so that's why they have an issue to recall. That and you. Well, putting, it's also a cost issue, Ken. Let's call it really clear. It's not. They have not issued a recall, and and. Uh, 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 you're alerting the industry to this potential problem, and now they know about it, and and they need to make it make their own decision about whether they're going to use the product or whether they're going to figure out a way to get around it or how they're going to deal with it. Here's a question: I've sold you well listed systems, both certified and non-certified, for 30 years at a premium charge, as a competitive edge. Manufacturers test products in the in the own in-house labs on the UL's oversight. So it seems that manufacturers have been at best not thorough and at worst deceptive. The manufacturers involved and UL have tremendous exposure to liability. At the installing company, I've been defrauded. I have unintentionally defrauded consumers, AHJs and insurance underwriters. Is there anyone uh, on the call from UL or ETL who care to comment on this? Well, uh, uh, you haven't been defrauded yet, and you haven't defrauded anybody yet. So take a step back. Let's let's wait to see how the manufacturers respond to all this. Here's some more. Uh, if you want to see, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, Ken. Here's some more from the AHJ. Furthermore, NFPA 72 household fire warning maintenance and test references. NFPA 72 Chapter 14 29.10 maintenance and tests fire warning equipment shall be maintained and tested in accordance with the manufacturer's published instructions and per the requirements of chapter 14. It would appear as though all that is needed is again, a recall. Okay, there's no recall here. So we can't deal with a recall. Uh, what is the obligation of the alarm company that have this equipment presently installed as related to their existing and past customers what is it that they do now uh, uh, and, and what happens if they fail to? Well, uh, again, Jeff, Jeff has expressed his opinions on this product and uh, convincingly, but still the manufacturers have not yet uh, issued a recall. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, I suppose that there are experts that would disagree with Jeff. I don't know, maybe there aren't. But I'm assuming there might be because of other because the manufacturers know about Jeff's uh, uh, findings and have not issued a recall. That's accurate, is not? Is it? Isn't it, Jeff? They know about it. It is issue. accurate. Yeah, and they have not. Right. They haven't issued a recall, but I have not. Out of the thousands of people that have visited my LinkedIn site, no one has said that I'm wrong. No one in regard. No, no one has no, said. I, I understand that, but now as a, the, an alarm dealer has to say to himself, "Well, wait a minute. Based on what Jeff Zwerin is said, telling us, will I be as as but, as uh, Peter mentions, defrauding my customers but, by but, using hold, the product?" Can, I, I don't ask think the people. Yeah. The people that are on this call know what the right thing is. If they believe that the test was reliable, if they believe the plain language of the standards applies, as interpreted by myself and Merton, Merton would not be involved if he didn't believe he was correct. He doesn't do a lot of peer reviews. He's an NFPA instructor. He travels around the country teaching. He's an engineer in 35 states. The point is, alarm professionals know that this is not acceptable. So okay. if they know it's not acceptable, what do they do? Nothing? Okay, I got a lot of questions to get through, Jeff. I'm so sorry, go ahead. Let me move you along. What about other testing labs like UL? Have any other any of these labs uh, certified that these panels comply or are non-compliant? UL isn't the only testing uh, a certificate lab after all. It's any interesting. Other, so, right, so Inter Intertech, when my report came out, Intertech delayed uh, the applicability or the, in, the start date of the sixth edition of UL 985 without making the reason why no one has taken the professional responsibility to agree uh 
and that's for the moment. That's, you know, that's fine until something happens and things have already happened. But the answer is no, no one has, 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 has taken responsibility and told the truth regarding this nonconformity. All right. I don't want to, I don't mean to rush you or anything, uh, but, but we, I want to get through all these questions. So, so actually sure. here's something you might be used to. Your Honor, please tell the witness to answer yes or no when, when he can. Okay, here we go. Well, uh, tell, 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 tell the, the <laughs> gentleman that I can't answer yes or no without misleading the jury. And uh, surely he doesn't want me to do that. Oh, you are a difficult witness. I can see that. Is the Power Series Pro the only non-conforming component we are aware of at this time? If not, what are the others? Well, again, the Honeywell Vista line, uh, you can go to the Alarm Channel. There's a bunch of different products there that I've tested, DMP, different products. Based on time, I would say to go to the Alarm Channel, and there's a bunch of different manufacturers. Anything pretty much with a single data bus it's probably non-conforming. Okay. The problem uh, doesn't really rise on commercial fire only. They're more expensive and they have a different methodology. Okay. Out of the manufacturers that you have contacted, have any of them responded to to issue a recall? No, they haven't. We know that. Or correct, correct. their data bus architecture. No, no one has, but it's interesting. A lot of the employees from some of these companies have said, wow, I'm really concerned about this, and I'm going to refer it, again, generally speaking, to someone there. So people that know, that are in the industry, Ken, that are not, that are doing the right thing even when no one's watching, are going to be concerned about this, and rightfully so. If right. we know of a risk, and I think you can agree to this, if we know of a risk in the alarm industry, we want to try to address that, whether it's through a contract or whether it's through proper documentation in other ways. I mean, why would an alarm company want to put its head in the ground when they're talking about life safety of, of a family. Right. It defies logic. Do you think Johnson Control is oblivious or criminal here? I'm not, don't answer that. Are they stupid? Don't answer that either. Are they balancing costs? Okay, uh, Jeff can't answer that because he doesn't know what the, why, why they're not responding. Maybe they just don't agree with him. Are you aware of this same issue occurring on the Vista 20P and other related Honeywell model panels that use a similar keypad bus wiring configuration while using LTE-15 uh, 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 and LTE-XA communicators. Right. So, okay. yeah, thanks. So I already answered that, but again, just to make it clear, the Vista 20P is a great panel, just non-conforming, okay? Everything tie on the Vista panel, everything ties in parallel. If you want to take a radio, it's going to be on the bus. It's going to be on the enhanced control protocol bus. Uh, it, once it shuts down, whatever radio you have, it's irrelevant. It's going to shut down. We have a dialer capture radio that's tied to the aux power, and the aux power is short on the bus. What happens to the dialer capture radio? It's over. Okay. Here's, here, on a uh, they're asking on a takeover system, assuming you have a, have a K and K contract, and you're made aware of NFPA and UL standard violations or, or this issue, if you note them on the disclaimer notice, how much protection would you have? Well, you, Ken, should, that's your answer. you, should, notice, you should notice it on the disclaimer notice on a takeover. That's positive. That you definitely should. Where can we get the letter? I don't know what letter you're talking about. Uh, it sounds to me like Jeff has made a very good case for, um, I don't know what this, it says you, you've made a good case for you making a deal with DSC and other manufacturers with similar, to rectify the problem. You well, know, I think Jeff has, has identified a problem. I don't know whether he's made a, he's made a, uh, 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 I don't know, I don't, I don't know about that. Jeff, Jeff well, let me just say this to you. The, the issue is, if we're in the life safety business and I didn't write the codes and standards, I've been involved over the years, and, and Merton has been much more involved. Are we going to let this go, or are we going to pay attention? If it's your family and someone gets seriously injured or killed in the fire or dies, can are you saying, I don't, I don't think your legal advice is that they can sign a disclaimer and have no liability if something fails, are you? You're not saying that. Has anyone submitted this to the CPSC? It was submitted to the CPSC. have not heard back. But I've also heard that they're not very funded right now, and they're new funding with the Biden administration. So we'll be resubmitted or looked at again, but I have not heard back. 
Okay. Have you found any systems that do comply? The systems that do comply for household fire are going to be commercial 864 panels that don't have this methodology. Much more expensive, have an open frame transformer requirement, have to be a separate system. And of course, there's a cost involved. And that's not what we should have to do. We should be able to use a UL 102395 combination listed system. The question is, is there a problem? What does the standard say? And what are the consequences of doing nothing? We're in the life safety business. A short circuit is foreseeable. It's detectable. And we can have a system that works like a commercial panel should works. There's no reason to have non-conforming equipment, but for people not complying with, again, these are the, Ken, these are the minimum requirements. These aren't my requirements. Okay. Minimum okay. Requirements. Jeff, have you been able to test any equipment that does comply? Or you just answered that one. I have, yes. I've tested. There's a bunch of Honeywell panels that comply, but they're going to be listed for commercial fire. I have not found any residential panels that, that I've tested. I think I've tested about six or seven. Take a look at the alarm channel that, because they're all single data bus, Ken. As, 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 a, as a layman, Jeff, because I'm not technical, is this bus issue a, a pretty much a residential issue as opposed to commercial? Well, it, it's, 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 it's mainly a residential, but when you get into the, for example, the combination listed commercial Berg fire panels, it's the same problem. Okay. The problem with this webinar is now is that the attendees are aware of this defect. Can they now be held accountable, blah, blah, blah. Well, I, 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 I've responded to that, uh, or maybe I did privately with Jeff. You're, you're aware now that Jeff uh, Zwern and, and, and Merton uh, Bunker have an opinion about these panels, and uh, uh, their opinion is uh, not necessarily gospel, but it's their opinion, and you now have to evaluate it as an alarm professional on your own, you still have the manufacturers and and the regu the uh, uh, labs to uh, laboratories to uh, uh, back you up to some extent. But I would think that you're that you're on inquiry notice for sure at this point. Um, Ken, can you think of a disadvantage of alarm dealers reaching out to these manufacturers and trying to get these this problem solved? Well, here's someone who doesn't want to doesn't want to. Uh, too late to put my head in the ground since I've sat on this. Thanks for putting even more on my, my already overloaded plate. Well, I'm sorry, but I, life safety is more important. If you had concierge counsel uh, uh, and read what's up on the screen, you wouldn't have these problems, young man. Uh, the answer to the previous question, has any been reported to uh, P uh, P C P CPSC? Is no, why not? Well, it's been reported. They haven't gotten an answer. How would you know why? Okay. Yeah, we don't, uh, we don't know why. Is the problem with the written standards or with, or is the problem with the testing to confirm? Con, uh, well, let, let me get Merton to answer that and I'll chime in. Okay. Can you repeat the question, please? Clarity. Is the problem with the written standards or is the problem with the testing to confirm conformance with the written standard? Well, I, I personally, I think that the, the standards are pretty clear. Uh, it, it talks about, you know, the, the testing of equipment on a combination system and the codes and FPA 72 and the UL standards are written very similarly because typically one of those codes or standards will, it's a chicken and egg. So the committee says, hey, we've got this problem in the field where this is happening. Let's put it in the code and then the UL product standards pick it up or vice versa. It's written nearly identically in both the code and the standards. To me, it, it's pretty clear. Okay. And I agree. I mean, this is the problem with, with manufacturers and the testing labs. I mean, the, the, the testing labs could not would not list it if they took the time to do the test, which UL admits. They say they don't have to do that. And that's not what the standard says. And remember, that's from the president tasking the principal engineer to respond to 43 page expert report for myself and a peer review report from Merton Bunker. And as you know, expert reports and peer review the criticality of that. Again, this problem is not an option. This, just because the CPSC doesn't do a recall, an alarm contractor's got to put pressure on the manufacturer. 
Otherwise, do you think the manufacturer is going to indemnify the alarm company or UL? Is going to, I don't think so. I've never heard of a case. And more importantly, we want our customers safe. That's all that matters. We want our customers safe. If they made a mistake, that's fine. Fix it. Get the problem fixed. Let's make money in what we do. Let's limit our liability. But we've got to make sure we're starting with a balanced product that, that has conformity. That's what okay. everybody Here's a comment. I'm going to skip over two questions and get back to them. We have to. We only have a couple of a minute or two. I have, I have to let everybody go. It, 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 this is from a former former inter inter tech. Yes. L L L S Global. Uh, 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 he says Arthur Lee of CPSC is well aware of the issue, and why they're saying nothing is baffling. Okay. And well, that's news to me. Not an option. He agrees that it, that it's something that has to be taken care of. Um, what can we do to file? So it's now it? just not that's my opinion. Person. Well, John, you can send me a big fat check, which I know you're not going to do. So the answer. Can you is repeat no. that again? The last part, Ken. <laughs> All right. This this is a technical question, though. Have you tested the efficacy, efficiency, of the Honeywell isolator module? in your I have. Uh, S, wait, S bus fire or short circuit test setup, such as with Honeywell Vista 32 uh, FBPT panel? I have. The ECP isolator doesn't solve the problem. I've Good. tested it, and I think I have a video on it. Good. Here's, Remember, here's, I started in the alarm industry, Ken, in 1969 when I was nine. I've been continuously in the business. So to your person, I've got an active alarm contracting practice also. So I'm actively in the industry and I love this industry. And I want to make sure everyone stays safe and has a chance to protect their customers. Here, this takes away the reliability factor, which is normally can north of 90%. I mean, if we have one functioning smoke detector, the chances of survivability are 50% greater. This is a critical issue. It's got to be addressed. I don't know of any other product or any other problem in the industry which is as serious as this, because it's the part of the system, the brains of the system. Has this been reported to the news media? I have not reported, no. Okay, Here's, this is the last question, not a question, yeah, it is a question, and I think it's a good way to end. What is the alarm channel that you keep referring to? The alarm channel is, uh, it's on YouTube, and it's, it's basically a compilation of tests of the control panels on the data bus to see how they respond or don't respond. Panels that, this is your panels YouTube? Don't. This is your, I'm sorry? Is that your vehicle, the alarm channel? It is. Oh, okay. I how don't do advertise they, it until now. With well, how, do they get, how do they get to it? Well, how if someone they, asked me, listen, if you test the panel, they would individually call me. This is about, we need to get the manufacturers looking. It's, if you looked at LinkedIn, a lot of those videos from the alarm channel are already on there. Okay. Well, we ran over a little bit. I want to thank everybody for for uh, attending and participating as well with all of your questions. They were they were uh, keeping Jeff and uh, Merton on their toes, I'm sure. Uh, and we're going to sign off. If anyone wants to do a follow up webinar on this, or if Jeff or Merton want to do a follow up follow up webinar on this, we'll be more than happy to sponsor it. And uh, with that, you guys have any part? Thank you, Ken. Words, anything else? Thank you. Okay. No, I appreciate I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to speak. I appreciate you know your being involved and and wanting to look at it in an independent way. And that's the way we're trying to look at it. And um, okay. there, hopefully, this problem will get resolved. Uh, but the goal is is to keep to make sure that we have we have conforming products because it's difficult for an alarm contractor to do the right thing when the products are non-conforming. Again, most of them they don't even know about this problem. And the goal is, aware, you know, knowledge is power. Well, you had a well-attended webinar, so plenty of them know about it now. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Have a great take day. Care. Stay healthy. Take care. And take Thank care. Thank you. Thanks. Okay.